Hey humans, how's it going? Susan Ruth here. Thanks for listening to another episode of Hey Human Podcast. This is episode 336, and I had a conversation with Will Carter. Will's wife was diagnosed uh, a few years back with cancer, which made him begin to think about life and death and the important things. He began studying as a conscious dying end-of-life coach and sacred passage end-of-life doula. He's also a lawyer and a musician. We discuss his journey and what he's learned in his studies and the things that draw him to his music and his creativity. It was a really interesting conversation and shout out to John Slicer for introducing us. In other news, I saw Triangle of Sadness. Oh my gosh, it's phenomenal. Definitely a theater or big home screen kind of film. As always, I recommend not looking up anything about it or watching trailers because trailers give so much of movies away and it makes me crazy. So there's that. I have a show in Washington State, so Seattleites, Eastsiders, and beyond. I've got a show at Miller's in Carnation on Friday, November 4th. Great night of stories and song. I'm really excited for it. been practicing my butt off. For tickets, go to millerscarnation.com, and I hope to see you there. Also, uh, for those of you who vote in the United States elections, please, please vote. Midterm races are so close right now. Voting is Tuesday. Uh, This comes out on Thursday, and so the following Tuesday, the 8th. But you can early vote in many states, which I did. It's important. Get out there. Let your voice be heard. Women's bodily autonomy, health and well-being, Medicare, Social Security, climate, insurance costs, things like that. So much more. Let your voice be heard. Stand up for yourself and get out there and vote, vote, vote. Well, vote once, but you know what I'm saying. Check out heyhumanpodcast.com for links and to learn more about my guests and the show. Check out susanruth.com to learn about me and my other artistic endeavors. And follow Susan Ruthism and Hey Human Podcast on social media. Find my albums on Apple Music or wherever you get your music. My most recent record is called All I Ever Wanted Was Everything. Also, check out my relationships and sex show, Are We There Yet?, with sexologist and healthcare practitioner Mara Edelman. It's on YouTube under youtube.com slash show. Please rate, review, and subscribe to Hey Human on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. It's really helpful and helps support the show. All right. Thanks for listening. Be well. Be kind. Go vote. Here we go. Will Carter, welcome to Hey Human. It's great to be here, Susan. Shout out to John for connecting us. Yeah, John. John can make lots of connections in lots of different directions. It's uh, great to have him in my networks. Tell me where you grew up. Grew up in West Virginia and uh, been here all my life, except for when I was uh, on the East Coast going to schools. I thought about other options just so um, I wouldn't feel like I was making an ignorant choice coming back. But I was back in West Virginia every summer and um, could never find a place where I could have the quality of life that I can here. What do you like about West Virginia? So there's a lot to like. I mean, I enjoy, you know, outdoor activities and I enjoy string band and, you know, uh, roots music. There's a lot of that around here. Um, I think what I enjoy the most, though, is the sense of community. Um, West Virginia is, uh, there's just a real sense of belonging for people who, for most people who are from here. Um, And I don't know if it's true or not, but somebody told me that, that Google had done some analysis of email addresses and like, the number of people who have their name followed by WV at gmail.com is like off the charts compared to any other state. Now, that may be totally, you know, something somebody made up, but it wouldn't surprise me. There's a real sense of, um, of belonging for people here, and, and I think it's a, uh, a partly a connection to the land and partly a connection to each other uh, and a sort of sense of shared uh, uh, destiny. You, you, you really, to live a good life here, you got to connect with other people. What did you go to school for? 
what did I go to school for? Well, I'm a lawyer by license, so working backwards, my last three years were, were in law school. Um, I studied history uh, as undergraduate and as a, and a master's degree. So, uh, but I went to school, um, you know, in part just to see what life was like other places um, and to get an experience. You know, I was in New York City, I was in Boston, I was in Washington. So I kind of got the big city tour, had a great time, loved it, but still couldn't have as much fun as I do back here in West Virginia. Any particular part of history that appealed to you? Yes, um, it was U.S. social history, which is sort of history from the bottom up, if you will. So uh, not so much about the wars and the politics, more about um, you know how communities were built over time, how the frontier moved west, immigration, labor, sort of history from the bottom up. You know, there's a lot of talk these days about how the history that we learned as kids, for example, was whitewashed or didn't really include a lot of the the stories of the people that were truly built the country. Did you find that to be true in your education or did was it pretty good at encompassing everybody? Well, so um, I think there's no question that history has missed huge parts of the story. Um, the, what I might question is whitewash because it sort of suggests that people knew what they were doing. You know, each person sort of operates in their own world and I think that people wrote the history in the past that of the world they knew. And most of the people who are writing history were white privileged guys. Right. And so they, they told the history that interested them and that was relevant for them. Um, and it came natural to them, if you will. Uh, and sure, there were people who were manipulating that on behalf of certain economic or political agendas, but for the most part, it was just, um, frighteningly incomplete. And so social history was really, kind of a movement inside of history to try to change that. But it was at the very beginning, and it was still mostly <laughs> being written by uh, highly educated white guys, okay? And so, you know, when I was in school in the early 80s, that, um, you know, the, but it, was, it tended to be a little, um, uh, you know, very focused on immigration and labor history and sort of history of, of how communities came together. There wasn't at that point the consciousness of, the intersection of, you know, different um, histories relating to gender or race or whatever. It was, it was uh, something that um, I think was social history was just beginning to get into it, but it hadn't become sort of identity history. It was really mostly about how communities came together. Um, and that sense of place to me is, is sort of a driving uh, force that I think often people who move from one place to another in pursuit of a career or in pursuit of a certain lifestyle, it's hard to understand. Um, but I think the majority of people in the world and even people in this country have a deep sense of place, but it's not something that is really talked about and, and lived a lot by a lot of, for lack of a better word, the sort of coastal and highly educated elite. And, and that's fine. That's their lives. But it's, it's, I think they're missing a lot along the way. Um, and, um, uh, and often makes it hard for them to connect to, you know, to people who don't have that experience. Uh, yeah, for so sure. it's, you know, we all tell the stories that we are capable of understanding, which is a function of our, our backgrounds, right. And our language and how we make sense of the world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That is a very good point to make that the people that were, that had the microphone, if you will looked in a particular way and moved throughout the society in a particular way. And what is that old saying that uh, history is written by the ones who win the wars and have the spoils? <laughs> right. And, yeah. Yeah. What kind of law did you study? Um, I studied mostly sort of public law. So uh, policy, um, uh, the, the, the rules that, you know, affected um, uh, social welfare programs, um, uh, civil rights, things like that. I was, it was a public interest program that I was a part of. When I got out of law school, I was a legal aid lawyer, which meant that I represented people who had no money. Rather different than the later part of my career. That's interesting to me that it sounds like between your undergrad and your grad studies, social justice and, and humanity was more your focal point. Did you have inclinations to go into social justice as a career? I mean, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I like that's why I started off as a legal aid lawyer. Um, uh, and a lot of my early years practicing law 
you know, was involved in lawsuits trying to improve social systems, health, education, welfare, environment, things like that. Um, and um, one of the things that I began to recognize is that litigation, lawsuits, are a pretty good tool for taking a system that's horribly broken and making it okay. But it's not a very good tool for driving excellence. That um, if, if, if what it takes to build thriving communities in, you know, in places that are uh, like West Virginia is, is not just not being horrible, you actually have to really operate at a pretty high level. And litigation was not a great tool. You can't whip people into excellence, basically. And so I realized that, you know, in the progressive political work I had done before law school, going door to door and doing, you know, sort of advocacy kind of work, and then mm -hmm. as a litigator, that I wasn't really learning much about how bigger systems worked. And that really interested me. Um, and, uh, you know, through that began to explore, um, you know, business and private business and that whole side of the world, which is a big, big part of what makes our world a better place. I mean, as, as, as open as I am to the notion that, you know, government can and should make a huge difference, positive difference in people's lives. Um, there's still the most people live a good life in my opinion, because of the, the, the opportunities that are created through private enterprise. And so the challenge is to how to balance both of those. Anybody who thinks private enterprise by itself will produce the greatest good, I think is, you know, deluding themselves, but though there are plenty of economists who think that. I also think anybody who thinks that all we need is, you know, government handouts and rights without responsibilities is also deluding themselves. And so um, I, I guess at this phase of my career, I'm sort of combining both what I learned in the private sector and what I learned in the public sector and trying to figure out how to, how to you know, add something to this very difficult situation we're in in our country and in our state. There's a very isolationist feeling around people that they think that they have to, you know, it's mine, it's only mine. If I get it, you know, I'm going to scrap to get it. I'm going to hurt whomever to get it. You know, there's a lot of that sensibility out there in the world, I think. There is. I mean, I think we all have an, have an impulse to recognize the value of working with other people, but we also have the impulse to say what's mine is mine, right? I mean, and, and so uh, there are people who go to one extreme and there are people who go to the other. And in my experience, that's just as true among low-income communities as it is among higher-income communities. Um, the and, and I would say that my clients, when I was a legal aid lawyer, they were making really good use of their communities. It was, frankly, the only way they could survive was to help each other out in ways that might not have advanced their careers, but it, um, it was part of what it took to get by. Um, and, you know, even today, absolutely, I've heard many people say this, and it sounds sort of hokey, but it is so true, and all of us have experienced it, is, there's no better place than to, to break down in a car than a rural place in West Virginia. I mean, you know, people will, will help you out. Um, it doesn't matter if you don't look or talk like them, you know, they'll help you out because you're in sense of need. And, and that's a, uh, there have been studies about, you know, how often in the last month did you, um, you know, help or get help by a neighbor or, you know, connect with your neighbor, you know, one-to-one -one. And in West Virginia it is at the top of those lists. So neighborliness is not just like a, something they teach you in kindergarten. It's like really practical when you live in smaller towns and smaller cities um, that don't have as much infrastructure that takes care of you, you know, by right. You have to do it by building connections and building obligation with people around you. I think that there is uh, an unfortunate um, tag put on, especially lower income people, that somehow they don't have a sense of that. You can't, I think, live a good life materially without learning to connect with and rely on your neighbors in small towns and rural areas. We're here for each other. We're going to lift each other up yeah. and make sure there's not for want. If you live in a suburban or you know, reasonably comfortable urban area, you can live a pretty good life and you don't need to get to know your neighbors, right? I mean, it's just, it's, it is a a luxury, I guess, and a privilege, not one that I'd care to have because I, I like knowing my neighbors. I mean, I live in a community of 13 people who all, you know, live, live here and have lived here, you know, 13 households that over time have built their own community starting back in the early 70s and they all came here together. So, I mean, to me, connecting with community is a big part of what gives life meaning. 
Absolutely. How did you, I know you're a musician, you play upright bass. How did all of this along the way, because people would think, oh, that's one part of your brain. How in the heck did you get the other part of your brain so active that you were able to pursue music? Did you have that in the house growing up? It sounds like. So music's actually been the only constant, you know, I've changed relationships, I've changed careers, but music has been a constant since I was about 14 years old. My, what my mother was told by a fifth grader that I needed to be getting some other interests. And I start, and so I took guitar lessons for a couple of years and it, it had no interest for me. I shoved it under the bed and kept playing sports and doing what I was doing. But around age 14, you know, though I was still reasonably competitive in sports, it really wasn't quite the same uh, ego satisfaction that it had been. And so when my cousin started playing bluegrass and string band music and being the center of attention and the girls liked it and I noticed that my mother let them drink beer when they were playing music. I said, I can figure this out. And so I started learning how to play bluegrass so I could play with my cousins and my uncle, their father. And uh, so it was in the family. Um, and uh, then you know, I've played ever since then. Uh, and and it's, it's been the one constant. It really is what probably brought me into um, an interest in being in West Virginia and connecting with community and serving, you know, community. Um, it was, it really has been the primary sort of common thread through my life. I, before I met my wife officially, I, you know, was playing bass and and seeing her dance on the, uh, contra dance floor. And, you know, so there's a lot of connections into different parts of my life that come through, through music. Uh, and even my early political work, um, it was through the, music that I met artists and through artists, I met activists is, you know, the small place like West Virginia, those are all connected. And, uh, that was a community that I felt I really enjoyed being with, um, more than, you know, in, in any other one. I liked the other ones, but they weren't as interesting to me as the ones I met through music. What got you to the stand up bass from guitar? And you just flipped it over. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, in college, I, uh, had the, had the good fortune to the first year, I mean, the first week of school, um, uh, down the hall was this phenomenally gifted banjo player. Her name is Allison Brown. She's won Grammys and, and, uh, has a record company in Nashville called Compass Records. And, uh, we started playing me on guitar and her on banjo. Um, but I wasn't a very good, uh, singer. So we said, well, we'll get one of these people who sings in, in these glee clubs or something to teach them bass. Bass is easy. Um, and so we bought a bass and, uh, had a friend of mine, still a good friend of mine, uh, taught him how to play bass, but he, he was not ultimately able to put the time into the, uh, to the band. And Allison very quickly went on to play with way more accomplished musicians than I was. And we were left with a bass. And so senior year, I decided I was going to learn how to play bass because by that time I'd figured out I was never going to be a hot flat picker. I had the good fortune to take lessons from this great flat picker named Russ Berenberg. He's still doing great stuff. And he didn't tell me, but I figured out that flat picking was not going to be a big part of my future. And so I said, well, I might as well play bass. And that was uh, senior year. I learned how to play bass and I've been playing it ever since. Prior to the pandemic, I was at a band called Blue Yonder. We played every Tuesday night at a local restaurant um, in Charleston. It was great and 95% original music. And our songwriter and singer, John Lilly, just a phenomenally gifted, uh, gifted fellow. He'd, he'd spent time in Nashville before uh, coming to West Virginia. And um, he just wrote a lot of fantastic songs. And uh, it was like a eight year song cycle, you know, every, every year, every, every, every show was just the story about his characters and his songs. It was fantastic. Um, the pandemic hit, um, he needed to move away. Um, and so, uh, no longer playing with blue yonder. Uh, and, um, but now I have a new trio called slow train and unlike uh, blue yonder, which is mostly was mostly original sort of acoustic honky tonk. We called it slow train. We feature some original songs that our, that our lead singer writes, who is a great singer, Rob McNerlin. But we also do mostly, this is sort of interesting, a, we do covers of the country covers that the 65 to 75-year-old sort of alt rockers were doing. So Burrito Brothers, Dylan, Dead, you know, a lot of them covered country music. And you know, I didn't know that the songs that I was hearing that the Grateful Dead were doing were done by Haggard and Hank Williams. I came to those songs through through the Grateful Dead when I was listening to music. And so 
we basically have a band that does a lot of the country covers that those guys did in a country format. Uh, the, the lead guitar player in, in the band is just fantastic. Robert Schaefer, who was also in Blue Yonder, just twice has won the national flat picking contest. Just a, just a phenomenally gifted uh, artist. So Rob's a great singer and Robert's a great picker and I'm a pretty good organizer and uh, good at getting gigs. And so between the three of us, you know, we have a lot of fun. But we're only playing outdoor gigs at this point. Um, my wife's uh, sort of severely immune compromised, and so I'm not doing any indoor uh, gigging at this point. So my music playing has significantly been reduced. Mm-hmm. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, your wife has cancer, or is she in yeah, remission? She has leukemia. She has leukemia. She has leukemia. Um, treatments have gone great. Um, I mean, you couldn't couldn't ask for better results. Uh, it is most likely going to be a chronic condition, not something that, um, you know, is expected to shorten her life. And of course, it's a rare condition, so there's not like a whole lot of research on this, but her response to the treatments has been great. It does leave her very vulnerable to infection. Um, leukemia is basically cancer of the parts of your bloods that, blood cells that fight, can't fight um, disease, and so the treatment gets rid of those blood cells, which means she's very vulnerable. So... Um, we have to keep our distance, but we still do a lot outdoors. And, um, you know, we went to a 10 day music festival this year. We just keep distant from people and, uh, stay safe, uh, and wear masks when we need to. And, uh, you know, we're, it's a different pattern than it used to be working all from home, but, uh, getting out a lot and just grateful that we live in such a place where I can go out and run on the ridges and be outside and not have to worry about a whole bunch of people. Yeah, for sure. When we chatted a couple of weeks ago, we started talking about the nature of death and you became interested in things around that. Can we talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, I mean, there, there were sort of, I think, different, two different, I guess, uh, lines of thinking that caused me to want to become, go through courses that, that one was called a conscious dying coach and one is called death doula sacred death doula and I, I completed both of these courses in the first half of this past year um you know i'm 60 years old most of my neighbors are in their 70s my parents are in their 80s i have not been touched a lot by death in my life i've been very fortunate in that um but i recognize that just it was pretty likely that death was going to be a much more prominent part of my life over the next 30 years than it has been so far, and I might as well study up on it, even though it was sort of abstract and academic, I could at least start getting smart about it in a book learning kind of way. Um, So there was that very, very practical, I can be useful to people around me if I'm sort of smart about all the different logistical and spiritual and sort of emotional components of, of, of dying. But there was also for me, I think, a real philosophical sense that um, that in a strange way death has this intimacy with life and 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 that you know when we are um, confronted with death uh, and or grieving in some deep deep way there's also sort of like the other side of that is, is that it's often accompanied by a real feeling of being quite alive and connecting with what it means to live and so I don't you know, I, I, this is not a domain I'm a specialist in, but it was really clear to me that in, on the most challenging days, you know, in the last several years, um, that, you know, a lot of what we were, in, in, and I'm speaking, you know, thinking about our, our country's political situation, um, that there was, uh, to a certain extent, there's a lot of grieving going on. Ways of life are changing and people are angry and people are um, sort of giving a middle finger to a lot of people as a result of that, but not necessarily real solution oriented. And there's grieving going on. And so one of my thoughts is that, that by studying grieving and dying, I could sort of begin to have some language to make sense of the grieving and dying that's going on in our own world. Um, for instance, one of the one of the lines of thought that I took away from the course is that anytime something changes, there's usually some loss associated with that. So when there's a loss, there's a there's a need to grieve. If you don't grieve, then that the 
the pain associated with that loss gets subsumed and probably comes out in some unhealthy way. And so grieving is the way we healthily deal with loss, which is always connected with change, right? And so to me, studying what smart people were saying about grieving might help me understand a little bit more about the grieving that is going on, you know, among a lot of people feeling that the political system and the economic system is rigged, is not taking care of them, uh, is, uh, you know, biased against them because of their background or their religion or the color of their skin. There's a lot of reasons for people to be grieving now. Um, when the economy was growing, you know, doubling between World War II and the mid-70s and everybody's income was going up, there were still a lot of reasons to grieve, but meanwhile, material life was getting better, and so people, they weren't as conscious of it. But for the last 40, 50 years, the material life has, that has you know, standards of living materially have gone up, but income hasn't gone up. Like half of working people are earning no more than they did 40 years ago when adjusted for inflation, uh, and they're working harder, right? And so um, there's a lot of a lot of anger and grief going on, and, and I thought maybe if I could sort of study grief that I might have some some ideas about, you know, how to uh, deal with the grieving that's going on and the death, if you will, of the world as we knew it, um, and then be able to, to deal with that directly rather than, uh, you know, unhealthily, which I think a lot of our body politic is doing. And so the challenge is how to deal with that change in a, in a healthy way that triggers you know, effective action for building communities and that are thriving um, and not ones that are walling themselves off and admiring themselves in tribal politics. Uh, I don't have the solution figured out, but I think I'm beginning to understand some of the mechanics that are at work, which I think is an important place to start. How has it shaped you with dealing with your own feelings around grief? Even though you say you haven't really lost a whole lot of people, surely in a lifetime, we grieve all sorts of things. There are great losses that aren't necessarily human life. Well, so I, um, great uh, example of what comes from book learning. You know, one of the books I read is called The Wild Edge of Sorrow. I think Francis Weller is the author of it. Um, and I won't do it justice, but, but what he says is that there really are five different types of grief that... Um, we really only as a culture recognize one of them and talk about them. And, you know, the five stages of grief for when somebody or something we have is lost to us that we uh, need to mourn. One of the other five that he specified is um, the grief that comes from being connected to the sorrows of the world. Um, and I think uh, as I observe what's going on in the world, whether it's climate change or the, you know, the, the decreasing lifespan for Americans or the increasing, you know, um, opioid addiction rates. There, there's a lot of sorrow going on and um, our capacity to deal with these challenges, I think, is actually getting worse, not better. Um, politically, uh, we're very polarized and divided rather than coming together on something. And so I was sort of grieving the, these sorrows of the world and my sort of expectation that people would come together to address them. Um, and and I, I recognize that probably a lot of people who are, who think of themselves as being conscientious, you know, civic, political, well-minded people are probably grieving because they're coming to terms with the fact that progress in a political or social system is not guaranteed. It's not automatic. We have to make it happen. And, um, we're having to confront that um, the world as we know it, largely free, democratic, materially secure, could change. Um, and we could slide into authoritarianism. We could slide into an anti-democratic um, way of being. We, uh, we could just slide into a sort of politically propagandized wokeness. Um, and I think there's dangers from both sides of the political spectrum that are really threatening to the world that a lot of us, especially white privileged people like us, could could sort of took for granted, and we're grieving that um, the loss of that innocence, which was really naivete, <laughs> but um, that helped me understand some of the grieving that I was feeling, which made it easier to sort of get through it on the other side and say, okay, what are we going to do about it? 
That's interesting. Were you finding yourself more angry before and now you're, you're more settled in? No, I didn't. Um, I was committed before, but I really wasn't. It was very operational and pragmatic. Mm-hmm. It wasn't really tending to my deeper emotional feelings. Hmm. Well, I think a lot of times when people aren't in touch with their emotional feelings, and I'm just going to throw men under the bus here because a lot of times it is men because they're not they are taught not to cry. You know, you're not supposed to have feelings. You're not supposed to. So they grow up with that information. I think things are changing now, but certainly from a certain generation, definitely that was the cause. Um, Did you find that you had, it comes out in other ways. It's sort of like you see a river going downstream and it comes upon a rock and it's not like then the stream stops. It has to go around the rock or go through some other cra- you know, crevice or, or crack or creek. Um, did you experience that then? And the realization that you were doing that? Because it's one thing to say, oh, I didn't even, I wasn't even in touch with my feelings, but I still think people who aren't in touch with those feelings, those feelings still come out. They just come out in weird other ways, masked by oh, other things. Yeah. I, I accept the opinion of experts that that if we suppress feelings, they will they will manifest in some unhealthy way. Um, uh, in in this instance, I I think it was really more just not having the language to work with the feelings. I knew that I was, um, you know, troubled and 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 bothered, but I I didn't I didn't think of it in terms of grieving. Right? I was it was it was like this is horrible, but, it, but I, I wasn't sort of treating it like a grieving process to go through um, and, uh, and just say, okay, this is what happens. You know, you have to grieve. And so I had a story about how to manage it. It was okay. And, and, and Weller's book, um, you know, I think is really great for that. It, it speaks one of the five um, types of grieving it speaks of is ancestral grief. People who um, are in a, in a lineage that has had, you know, ancestral uh, um, uh, suffering uh, and, and, you know, communities of color, Native Americans are, you know, example of that. But, but I would say even, you know, um, the suffering that came from the, the challenges uh, psychically to elite white slave owners. Um, I think Ta-Nehisi Coates' book, uh, his, thick, his latest novel, I think it's his latest, you know, paints a pretty pitiful picture of the white slave owners and how, in a way, they were um, they 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 weren't developing uh, themselves. So, you know, our our world situation always creates challenges for us. That's true for everybody, no matter how privileged they are. Um, it's just that certain certain communities and certain groups of people have to deal with a whole lot more challenges than others, and um, some wisdom is born of that. Um, but it's not fair that they have to accept more challenges than other people. Yeah. And bottom line is pain is pain and people are going to experience it how they, how they will. And I, I, we talk about this a lot on the show is that comparing pain and comparing suffering, you can't do it. It's apples and oranges. There's just, there's su- such different kinds of pain and suffering depending on the person and the experience, but it doesn't make it any more or less. I mean, we could argue, of course, I mean, that's enslaved. It's a horrible suffering, of course, but you, that, that being said, you can't take away from the fact that other people that did not have that experience have not also suffered. It's different. Right. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I accept the Buddha's teaching. We all suffer. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Know, it's, it's, it, <laughs> Um, and if we work at it, you know, we have the ability to understand that there are ways of reducing that suffering. Um, but I think that, uh, uh, you know, everybody's dealing with changes in their relationships, with changes in their body, changes in the situation around them. And then that change is loss, loss is grieving, and sort of we're into that cycle. Mm-hmm. And, and I think what I really like about Weller's book is that he – finds a place for the, the grieving process to stay with people and continue to inform wisdom. It's not like you move through it and leave it behind, which is what I think how some of the popular consciousness has come from Kubler-Ross's five stages of grief. It's like you go through those and it's over. It's like, no, no, no. It becomes a part of your wisdom and your aliveness uh, if you have the 
opportunity to give voice to it in a way that's constructive for the culture in which you are located. Um, so, you know, different cultures have different ways of expressing grief. I'm not somebody that thinks we all need somebody, you know, wailing uh, at a wake in certain places. That's fine. But in, it, that wouldn't work in, in, in my family. It would just, would just make, you know, it, it, each culture has its own way of giving voice to grief. They have to figure out what's right for them and, and do it and not get all dramatic about it. Just sort of say, no, this is like getting over, you know, any kind of um, challenging situation. Certainly that's music. Songwriters and musicians certainly embody and help uh, mitigate the pain of grief, I think, with a lot of their work. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, I know. I, um, that's my sense of things that, that, that they, uh, I mean, I, either they have great insight into the whole world or they have a great gift for giving voice to the grief that, that they speak in song. Um, but also joy. It's not just about grief. Of the, you know, I think the more, I think one can work through grief and become more joyful because of having done good, you know, effective grief work. But I also think it's possible to, to experience a lot of joy, you know, independent of any grieving past. But I do think it means more, the more, um, uh, somebody has had to work through grief. I mean, um, mm. there's uh, one of the writers, a really interesting guy, singer-songwriter, Stephen Jenkinson, interesting fellow. Um, he says we have to learn to love death um, because only if we love death can we truly learn to love life. And that sounds sort of formulaic, but um, it is such a sort of countercultural way of framing it that I find it helpful. And I love that I have studied death. <laughs> I'll take it that far. I think it's good for me um, and how people deal with death. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sorry that I haven't had to deal with it a lot. I did have one, you know, very, very um, sudden and surprising death of my sister early in the pandemic. And um, ultimately, I wasn't, in looking back, I wasn't satisfied with how I helped myself and helped others work that it wasn't horrible. There was no, you know, great, huge breakdowns, but it was, I looked back and I said, you know, I could have been more helpful to, um, uh, my parents could have been more helpful to my family going through this. Uh, I, I did the best I could, but it was, it was, you know, practice helps. And I had no practice, uh, dealing with death in a family. And so I said, well, before it happens again, at least I'm going to book learn about it. And that's why I took those courses. What's her name? Catherine. 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 May she rest well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, well, she me. lives on. She lives on. Uh, she has four kids uh, who are just, just great. And, and it's, it's such a charge and a, and a sense of, of just how there is life after death and, and being with her kids who are great kids. Yeah. And so that's, um, uh, you know, of course, they've had to go through grieving as well and probably always will. But it's they uh, she she was so devoted to them. And um, it's great to to be able to see her in them. Do you think about your own death very much? Um, I think about leading up to my death. So, um, you know, I'm a lawyer by license. And so I've paid a lot of attention to what they call advanced directives. Um, and what I would want if I was unable to meaningfully engage with other people and whether it would be possible for me to ahead of time say, if I can't connect with other people, um, you know, please let me, don't, don't let me die a natural death. Don't stick food in my mouth. Don't make me drink, you know, let me die. There's a term in, um, uh, the sort of death with dignity circles called uh, V said voluntary stopping or cessation of eating and drinking. And it's actually a relatively peaceful way to die. And um, it's real clear that somebody who's competent, let's say somebody who has, uh, you know, a, 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 some sort of cancer, but they're completely had their wits about them to say, I'm not going to eat and I'm not going to drink. It's not illegal. It's not illegal to support that. It's not illegal to, to not hooking them up to a feeding tube when they do um, you know, become unconscious. 
that is that is pretty clearly a legal right to die with by voluntarily stopping and eating and drinking. Um, it is, I think, a logical extension to say that if I'm somebody who has Alzheimer's and I, but I early Alzheimer's, I'm completely competent, able to make decisions for myself. And I say, listen, in the moment at which I can't connect meaningfully with other people, um, please do nothing to naturally sustain my life, including putting food in front of me. If I can't do it on my own or I don't ask for it on my own, you know, let me die because of lack of food and drink. Now that's a pretty extreme position for a lot of people. Um, and it's a work in progress. You know, when I first typed it up, I didn't have anything uh, in there about uh, if I ask for food, right? I may not connect with people, but I might say, I'm hungry. I want a burger, right? And my wife said, you think I'm not going to give you a burger, even if you don't know who the hell I am, if I'm, if you ask for a burger, you know? And so I said, okay, I need to change that. And it's, it's okay to give me food if I ask for it, but don't ask me to ask for it. You know, let me, let me be as I am. And if I don't ask for it and gradually shrink away, that's, that's okay. So I do think about the dying process a lot. Um, in terms of being dead, um, I think about it in terms of, of living on in, in the lives of other people, not necessarily memory. I mean, sure, we all have people we know that will remember us to varying degrees. But I, I have, a, um, uh, you know, my hope is that I will live on in people's lives, whether they know their lives are enriched by my having been present or not. Um, the best example of that is back in 1990, I started a string band music festival that's sort of become the annual gathering of old time musicians, um, like 4,000 people camping out for 10 days, playing music amongst themselves in, in this great site in West Virginia, no hired bands. Like the rainbow gathering comes to string band music and we just make music together for 10 days. And that is just such a treat for so many people. And people don't need to know that I did that in order for it to live on. And so when I think about afterlife, it's through the structures that are left in place that continue to mean something to people. I've had the good fortune to be involved in preserving some land forever, you know, that was going to be developed and arranging for it to be acquired and protected. That's something that lasts on. I don't need for people to know I did it as long as it's making a difference in their lives. So that's how I think about death at this point. Do you have a religious or a spiritual philosophy around death? I don't. You know, I, I think that there's a lot we don't understand about what creates forces in the world. So I'm open to, the, I guess, the mystery of not knowing. Um, uh, but I, I, I don't have any theory that, I, that there's an afterlife that looks this particular way or that there's another life that, come, that I come back later. Um, I tend to think of those in metaphorical ways. My afterlife is the string band festival. I'm back to life through my children and grandchildren who I help instill ethics and practices to that get passed down through generations. So um, uh, I was raised Episcopalian and sort of, I think that's a pretty uh, intellectual sort of religious tradition and um, that I've continued without the need to believe in an almighty God uh, in order to do that. How old are your kids? Um, so my my daughter is 26 years old, and I have two stepdaughters who are 36 and 40. Do you ever talk about death with them? Does that conversation come up? Yeah. Um, so uh, not a, I mean not a whole lot, but we've I mean it came up most recently because I was saying to my wife, I, you know, I don't really ha- we were we were asking each other what would we want for rituals after we died. That was part of the course, and. Um, we both said, you know, we don't really have a lot of thoughts about what that would be, what, whatever would make our family feel good, right? We didn't have real strong feelings about that. And then um, I said, well, you know, music's so important. It'd be kind of cool if, if uh, uh, we could get people to send in a song that, you know, if I died, that they, that they thought of me when they heard the song or something like that. And so my wife and my daughter together for my 60th birthday put the word out, to my different networks and said, send in a song that uh, we can give to Will as a playlist. They didn't tell him it came out of a discussion about death. Um, and so there's a Papa's playlist on YouTube music now. And, um, 
it's great. Uh, most of the people who submitted something didn't, they weren't real literal about it. It wasn't that they shared a song that we had shared together. There was some of that. Like my, my sister chose Carry On My Wayward Son by Kansas because she remembers me playing it over and over trying to learn that bass line on the guitar. Um, but most of the songs were more uh, about something fundamental that they associated with me or about our relationship. And it wasn't, the music was more of a lens into something broader than the music itself. And so that whole exercise, which ended up being a, one of the best birthday presents I've ever gotten, 55 tunes uh, and all over the place in terms of style, uh, was came out of a discussion about, you know, talking about death with my family. Uh, that's really beautiful. Tell people how they might find you uh, for your music and maybe they want to have some philosophical discussions. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> uh, sure. I mean, uh, hmm. Uh, well, you know, I'm on the, I think, the baby boomer uh, social media. So you can be found on Facebook, uh, Will Carter, you know, so they know that. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn. Send messages that way. Um, I do have a YouTube channel that uh, where my music is featured, uh, and I can't even remember what my username is there. Um, but, you know, West Virginia is a small state. If you know anybody in West Virginia who knows anybody, you can probably find me. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll put the links on heyhumanpodcast.com for people. And what was the name, uh, the specific names of the courses you took, in case people are curious about that? Oh, sure. They, and they should be. I, I, I just think it has enriched my life a lot. It's so the course is offered by the Conscious Dying Institute, and it is a, um, uh, a nursing-centered institute, meaning that uh, there's, a, there's a sort of a school of thought within nursing profession about that really takes the notion of caring and very rigorously and, and systematically breaks down the components of caring um, there's a lot of nursing that, you know, means you got to do this or somebody, you know, will die. I mean, it's, there's a lot of nursing that's science, but there's also a, a whole line of nursing theory and philosophy around caring, um, led by somebody who's from West Virginia, actually. Her name is Jean Watson. And one of her acolytes, I guess, um, uh, started an institute called the Conscious Dying Institute that is not for nurses, but it, it draws from that um, academic and philosophical background. Um, and I just think it was a great framework for somebody um, uh, like me to come in and, and not just learn the how-tos and the checklists and the things like that, but to really have it anchored in deeply philosophical and spiritual readings as much as practical ones, you know, that, that were that were very practical. You know, what are the different things you have to do with the funeral home and stuff like that. And so I thought they did a great job um, giving uh, practical and philosophical orientation to the topic of dying. They exist for the most part for, to support the creation of a, an emerging profession, which is called death doulas. And I absolutely predict that death doulas will become sort of like midwives, increasingly common and in demand. Um, you know, 40 years ago, when my wife was getting into midwifery, um, uh, you know, there was a lot of opposition to midwives from the establishment and hospitals wouldn't give them privileges and doctors were opposing their work. And it was relatively new in the market. And I think over that period of time, midwives have become, um, you know, much more accepted and valued. And the baby boomer generation did that. Well, now the baby boom, and at that point, right behind that were birth doulas, right? And so baby boomers who had a little extra income would pay for birth doulas. And I think we're going to see baby boomers being willing to pay for death doulas. Um, I think it's a great investment for those who can afford it. And there are death doulas who also offer it free of charge to communities that might not be able to afford it. Um, and if somebody's looking for a growth industry, I encourage you to look up and you like connecting with other people about really meaningful things. Um, I would encourage you to look up death doulaing and go to the Conscious Dying Institute to get started on it. I right now, because I can't go indoors with other people, can't get any of my practicums. So I'm, you know, in medical school, you, they spend two years in classroom and then the next two years they're actually out with patients. 
I've had the equivalent of my classroom experience, but I really have not been able to go volunteer at hospice or, you know, hospitals or the VA or something like that because of the condition with my wife. And so I'm, like I said, I'm book learned, but not, not I don't have practical knowledge. I just have academic familiarity with it. But the folks at the Conscious Dying Institute are full of people who have, you know, sat with thousands of people as they are dying. And a lot of wisdom and knowledge comes from that. Oh, yeah. And, and, and uh, most big cities, if you, do, if you Google death doula blank city, you're going to find lots of people who are in the business of being a death doula. But I think you'll find 10 times that in 10 years. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you got a chance to listen to any of the episodes on death and dying on Hey Human, but I interviewed Dr. Chris Kerr, who runs a hospice facility. Our conversation was incredible. And then I interviewed... Um, a woman who is from the company that will basically turn you into the fertilizer that then goes to become a tree somewhere, you know, that was a really cool mm-hmm. conversation. Yeah. I didn't encounter that. I'd like you to send me the link. I will. That. I'll send you the links. It's, it's like a, it's a version of green burial that I don't recall reading about. Yeah. It's really cool. I it changed because originally I thought, Oh, I want to be cremated. And then I thought, Oh, I want to be, you know, just thrown out in the woods or set on fire in a Viking kind of way. <laughs> then when I learned of this right. other way, I thought, oh, no, I want to do this. That sounds really cool. So I'll send you yeah, the links to that, it. You know, it's ringing a bell. Um, uh, but I, uh, yeah, I, I would like to, I would like yeah. to follow up on that. I, I agree. I you. think that sounds like a, <laughs> it's like a, it's like a green form of cremation, right? Yeah, and it's said that it's uh, land that won't be developed, so it's really great. And there's so much that is made from the process, and it's all natural, which is great. They use the um, a heat process without chemical, so it's better for the environment and all that. But you're left with so much really fantastic fertilizer that um, people can like use some of it to plant a garden at their house that they want to, or they can just go and put it and plant a tree in this forest or, you know, it's cool. I dig it. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that sounds very interesting. I'd like to like to learn yeah. more about it. Thanks for sharing that with me. Absolutely. And Will, thank you for being on the show. I really appreciate it. <laughs> I know oh, it came I've as a surprise <laughs> when I asked you. <laughs> I, no, I've enjoyed it. I, I appreciate the opportunity. I, I think, it's really hard to be good at about at anything without talking about it. And um, then you also have to practice it, obviously. But the combination of, of, you know, just thinking inside your own head is doesn't get you very far. So it's great to have an opportunity to talk about these topics with you. And, and um, I think that what you're bringing to your listeners is a real gift. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. Thank you. And thank you for listening, everybody. Bye. Thanks a lot, Susan. Take care. Bye-bye. Rate, review, subscribe to Hey Human Podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks. Bye.